Okay, thank you for coming out today. Um, today's guest speaker is part of KSU's Year of Cuba and is also uh, co-sponsored by the Bagwell Center for the Study of Markets and Economic Opportunity. Uh, my name is Professor Matthews. I am the director of the Bagwell Center. Um, our guest speaker is Dr. Archibald Ritter. He's a distinguished research professor in the Department of Economics at Carleton University in Ottawa, Canada. He has a BA in economics from Queen's University, an MA in economics from the University of Western Ontario, and a PhD in economics from the University of Texas. He's an expert in development economics with particular expertise on issues related to Africa and Latin America. He's written multiple books, most recently, African Economic Development, Entrepreneurial Cuba, The Changing Policy Landscape, and The Cuban Economy. His academic research articles have been published in journals such as Latin American Research Review, Canadian Journal of Latin American and Caribbean Studies, Canadian Journal of Development Studies, and Social and Economic Studies. The talk that he's going to be giving right now is titled The Cuban Economy, Private, Cooperative, and Underground. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Ritter to Kennesaw State. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for that uh, kind uh, introduction. Uh, I'm very happy to be in Georgia again. Uh, I've been here a couple of times before, not for long enough though. Uh, I love the trees in this state. They are magnificent and they all seem taller than the ones in my part of Canada, which is sort of central northern Canada. So uh, I'm, I'm glad to see that again. Uh, thank you for your interest in Cuba, for many of you. Uh, although I guess some of you are here because of your interest in uh, American history. <laughs> I hope you're not disappointed with a little, little uh, glimpse into Cuban history. Uh, I went to Cuba first as a young student in 1965. That's before your parents were born. Uh, I was an enthusiastic student. I had an interest in, in uh, social change, revolution. Uh, utopias, dystopias, and dysfunctional societies. Uh, and that interest in dysfunctional societies has continued to the very present. Uh, I have not focused on Cuba in the last two years, however, uh, in part because uh, my interest in the United States has been uh, magnified so greatly in the last couple of years. But let me proceed. Job, eh? there. Okay, what I would like to do in this session is to examine Cuba's small enterprise sector and the policies that Cuba has used towards that sector. That has been a very interesting experience, ranging from total abolition to more recent stimulation. The past policies have wasted a, a remarkably rich resource in Cuba that is Cub uh, Cuban entrepreneurship. And uh, I will emphasize how significant that entrepreneurship is in a minute. In 1993, liberalization started. And uh, the, the sector that had been abolished again became possible. That small business was made legal. Uh, then after 1993, there was a reversal and uh, controls were clamped down once again. Uh, but at this time, uh, I would say further liberalization uh, is very desirable, uh, but with certain caveats, a caveat on, in terms of income distribution and foreign ownership and control. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to look at entrepreneurship in, in Cuba to some extent, then Cuban policies towards small enterprise under Fidel Castro, then under Raul Castro, liberalization measures after 2010. Uh, I'm going to say a few words about the cooperative sector in Cuba. We always talk about the public sector, the private sector, uh, the market mechanism, government. In fact, there is a third level that should get lots of attention, and that is the cooperative uh, sector, the not-for-profit, non-governmental organization sector of the economy. So I'll say a little bit about that, and then uh, summary and conclusions. But I'd like to start with uh, a little slideshow to show you, illustrate what I'm talking about. So 
So I'm going to show you pictures of, of small-scale entrepreneurs in Cuba. Here is one. This is a photographer. In fact, uh, photography uh, like this was uh, not abolished in 1968. So uh, th these people have been out in front of the Capitol building photographing. You can see the age of that camera. Hey, that should be in a museum, probably. Those guys are still there. Here's another one. Uh, I love the camera. All of you are familiar with cars in Cuba. Oh, I forgot to ask. How many of you have been to Cuba? Oh, some. Good. Well, if you get a chance sometime soon, uh, uh, take a visit. And uh, uh, maybe Professor Matthews uh, will organize an academic tour, because one way to get into Cuba for Americans is with, a, with a, uh, an educational uh, academic uh, visit of some sort. At any rate, this is not an enterprise. This is a do-it-yourself part of the economy. This is the household economy that we all live in. Uh, and in fact, this guy is repairing his car. All of those cars were repaired in the do-it-yourself economy or the underground economy until very, very recently. Uh, it was illegal to have enterprises, uh, mechanics and so on, that would fix those cars. So all of that was done uh, in the underground economy or by people doing it for themselves. Cuba's mechanics are a major gift to humanity. They've kept those old cars going uh, since the 1950s. It's amazing. This is rural transportation, small-scale enterprise. BC taxis, bicycle taxis, a major mode of transportation in, in Havana and uh, other cities of Cuba. Some guys repairing a taxi, such a taxi. This is a, a major pon, ponchero, ponchera. This is a, a person who repairs uh, rubber tires. Uh, a basket maker and a, a vendor of, of uh, Santeria objects. Santeria is Cuba's ver version of voodoo. Uh, practiced in, in Haiti, uh, which is sort of uh, syncretized with Catholicism. That's a little salesperson there. This is an art market uh, some years ago, actually. This is a, uh, uh, a sort of an, an underground but legal activity. This was a fisherman off the, the, uh, the coast of Havana. You will look out there and see lots of people on inner tubes, and they're out there floating around fishing. Well. Um, uh, that's not an official enterprise, but that has, has, has been legal since, since the revolution, actually. This is the real estate market, if you can believe it. This was the real estate market. Uh, it was illegal to sell your own house uh, until very recently. Uh, but people would arrange for interchanges of houses, and they would go to this uh, central area with a little advertisement for their house that, that if uh, people who wanted to buy or exchange a house would go there as well with a payment, uh, an official payment through the state and then a compensatory uh, payment uh, under the table. Uh, this is just an agricultural market. This is a state agricultural market. This is an artisan market. The quality of artisan products in Cuba has become fantastic. Uh, that has been legal since 1993, and since that time there has been a burgeoning of, of high quality uh, artisanal uh, output, artistic output. This is the Barrio Chino, the, the, uh, the Chinese market, uh, which is a big thing, while other uh, restaurants had controls put on them and had limits to, of 12 seats, so you could not have a restaurant with more than 12 seats, all sorts of other restrictions. The, the Chinese community had special dispensation to establish big restaurants, very big, up to 50 or 100 uh, uh, people. And in fact, uh, some of the best food in, in uh, Havana would be purchased in, in the, the Chinese uh, restaurants. That's a recent uh, new restaurant. That's a high-end new restaurant. This is a, a retailer. This is a store, 1968. That's a, uh, a state sector store, 2002, sort of discouraging empty shelves. This is one, 2007. The statement of there, gracias Fidel por todo lo que os, dan, os das. Thank you, for, for de, thank you, Fidel, for all you give us. That's a, 
a surprise. Okay, entrepreneurship is a vital resource, I would say, in most areas of human de de endeavor. Uh, in uh, academia, you need entrepreneurs for new programs, organized conferences, etc. cetera. Uh, music, sports, uh, politics, but especially in the economy, you need entrepreneurship. Well, what does an entrepreneur do? An entrepreneur has a vision of something to be achieved, a project of some sort. The entrepreneur then brings together all of the people, all of the materials required to achieve that, and does everything necessary to bring it to fruition. Uh, so that's an important role in many areas of our society. Well, Cuba outlawed virtually all small enterprise, outlawed all of those entrepreneurs, if you can imagine it, back in 1968. And, in, uh, and he, that, he, he did that because that was capitalismo, capitalism. He wanted to eliminate capitalism. He said he wanted to rip it out by the roots. Uh, well, despite that, uh, Cuba has produced a nation of entrepreneurs. There are probably more entrepreneurs in Cuba per capita than, than United States or Canada. Why? Because almost everybody had to become an entrepreneur to survive in the state sector, for reasons I'll mention in a minute. Um, we don't have to become entrepreneurs. We become employees for the government, big universities, big businesses, and so on. Uh, and the, so, uh, uh, my, in my view, Cubans are probably more entrepreneurial than Canadians or Americans. In fact, the Cubans had a joke in, in the 1990s. They said, if you want to produce a Cuban entrepreneur, what you need is a raft, una balsa, a raft, so that they could cross over to Miami and one month in Miami. Uh, then you'd have a Cuban entrepreneur. Well, uh, th that's interesting because Cuba tried to create the new socialist man, so-called, uh, for, for 40 years. And what they ended up producing was a nation of entrepreneurs. Why did this happen? Well, it happened, it started in 1962 because they rationed everything. Everybody got the same ration. So what people would do was take the things they didn't want in their ration, like cigars and cigarettes if you were a non-smoker, and uh, you would you'd keep those and then sell them and buy something that you wanted. So everybody, because of the rationing system, started buying and selling or exchanging uh, products, 1962. Then in 1993, there was a major economic meltdown, which I'll discuss in a minute. Uh, all of a sudden, incomes fell. People were forced to try and, and survive, make ends meet on their own. Uh, so they had to set up little informal and uh, illegal enterprises in order to, to survive after 1993. And the central planning system caused problems because it was hard to plan everything from a central office tower in Havana. What happened was that enterprise managers uh, would find that, that the orders they were given, the, the inputs they were provided with, weren't appropriate. So they, every enterprise had to, to have somebody, the manager or a special person, who would go, go and try and find, through markets, the inputs that were needed and that weren't accounted for in the planning process. So. Uh, that's interesting, and the, the phrase they use in Cuba is luchar, resolver, inventar, conseguir. Fight, resolve, invent, and pursue. Um, so uh, that's interesting. Cubans became entrepreneurs on one hand. On the other hand, in the state sector, they were apathetic. They did not work hard. They, they minimized. And there's a, a, a joke about that that was used throughout Europe and, and uh, Cuba as well. And uh, the saying was, they pretend to pay us and we pretend to work. That's in the state sector. But then they would go home and, and hustle like crazy in order to make ends meet on their own. Um, so Cubans, are, I think, are entrepreneurial. Their efforts have been wasted on low-level survival activities until very recently. Well, um, oh, by the way, how many of you are studying economics? Hold your hands up high, let me see. Oh, some, okay. 
Um, I've got a chart here that is a, a bit economistic, maybe. Um, but uh, <coughs> I'm not sure I'll, I'll, I'll summarize this OK. Basically, I see enterprises organized uh, or categor uh, categorized in four ways. In economics, we think of the formal economy. Enterprises that are legal, that are registered uh, by the state. Um, but that is just a small part of uh, economic activities. Um, the household economy is huge. We do things for ourselves. We make our own meals. We, we clean our house. We uh, do the do-it-yourself jobs around the house. Shovel snow in Canada, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Look after children. That's the household economy. We could farm out all those activities through markets, and a lot of people do. They hire gardeners, snow shovelers, people to look after the children, butlers, maids, and so on and so forth. Um, but a lot of that is done in the household, and there's a lot of cooperation among relatives and among families, uh, within, uh, yeah, among neighbors, I should say. Then we have the formal economy, which I just mentioned. We have the informal economy. That is a, a large part of the economy, uh, especially in Cuba, where people produce legal goods and services, but they do it in a way that is illegal or it's unauthorized by the state. So there, there are, uh, one example that you may be familiar with is the plumber who comes to your house, does a job and say, oh, do you want to pay me cash or at, at such and such a price or uh, shall I uh, do this legally at a higher price and pay the tax? That is one type of, of informal uh, economic activity uh, illegal. He's, so the, the plumber is doing a legal thing. Fixing the, the toilet is very valuable, but he's doing it in an in an illegal way, unauthorized by the state for tax avoidance, tax evasion. Then at the bottom we have the criminal economy, and we're not concerned with that, but uh, that can be significant too. That's that's uh, drugs, uh, prostitution, sale of uh, stolen goods, and so on. So what I'm concerned with in this presentation is licensed self-employment, the cooperatives, and then uh, the part of the informal economy here, skipping the, the household economy and, and the criminal economy and so on. Well, getting back to Cuba. Cuba was a revolutionary regime. It turned communist uh, quite quickly. The revolutionary regime nationalized American enterprise first, then other foreign enterprise uh, in the first years of the revolution. Then uh, in 1968, Fidel decided that they had to radicalize the revolution further, and they nationalized virtually all business, down to the shoeshine boys. Uh, a few activities were, were not touched, seamstresses and a couple of others, but that was of just a very tiny segment of the population. All the rest of small business was nationalized, reorganized under, under sort of bureaucratic state enterprises. But why did Castro do this? Castro thought that capitalism, uh, or uh, producing something for your own profit, uh, deformed human personality. It led to excessive incomes on the part of, of uh, the, the entrepreneurs. Uh, he said that it uh, produced low quality goods and services, not true, and it used illegal problems, so they, he proceeded to nationalize. Well, the consequences were very harmful for Cuba and the, and the Cuban people. Um, the, all of the, the uh, it, it turned out that the state enterprises trying to organize these little, little uh, uh, operations across the country, they couldn't do it properly. They used a lot of bureaucracy, they were extremely inefficient. Uh, morale and motivation was diminished. They lost the expertise in the heads of all of those small businessmen. I mean, that's, that was an incredible loss. They knew what they were doing. They knew the sources of supply. They knew the markets. They knew how to produce the services and products. And that was all destroyed. Incredible. So what happened was that the quality of life worsened uh, immediately. The underground economy expanded because m many enterprises that were nationalized just went underground and produced their, their products illegally. Uh, so the, 
the consequences were not good. Then, however, things changed. In 1993, uh, uh, there was an economic meltdown, and it was caused by the determination of Soviet subsidies. Uh, the Soviet Union, as it turned out, was providing uh, increasingly massive subsidies uh, to Cuba, uh, especially in, in the 1980s up to a, uh, well, about 75 to 1980. These subsidies hidden in trade credits, never repaid. Price subsidies, that's a high price for sugar exports, low price for petroleum imports, and then straight development assistance. That was really high. It ended all at once uh, when, when Russia went to world prices. Uh, that led to a huge economic crisis. Could you back the, up a second the graph? Pardon me? Could you back up a second here? So are you saying it literally ended? It went from that last bar down to zero? Yeah, there's a tiny little thing. So there is an observation there. <laughs> yeah. Wow, okay. Um, so it was right after the collapse of the Soviet Union, right? 1991? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it just stopped Except even before that, because, uh, uh, what's his name? Gorbachev has stated in 1987 they were going to world prices, and then it was clear that th th that would happen uh, in a couple of years, and it did. So uh, it, uh, the end of Soviet subsidization produced a big depression in Cuba, and people had to, to uh, uh, make ends meet for themselves. So they went on the streets, tried to uh, sell something, tried to make something that could be sold, and so on. And in 1993, then, the crisis was so severe that the government decided to, to just to agree with or ratify what people were already doing. Um, well, the results were good initially. Uh, Cuba survived. Uh, people's day-to-day -day life was made better uh, when small enterprise uh, was made possible. Enterprises jumped up from underground. Uh, jobs, uh, of more official jobs, were created and so on. And such enterprises produced all sorts of stuff for tourists. They earned foreign exchange, they saved foreign exchange. This is a little chart just showing what happened. This was the, the uh, level of, of uh, employment in the, the small enterprise sector as a percentage of, of uh, total employment up until about 1990. I didn't have data for all those years. And then all of a sudden you had a big increase. Uh, so the, that was good. Um, there were income implications of this. All of a sudden, self-employed people pr providing services for tourists, that is in restaurants and tourist services and uh, uh, bed and breakfasts, uh, Airbnb kinds of things, their increase, incomes increased greatly. They became sort of an elite. But then most of the sector, uh, small enterprise, was, was producing low-cost goods and services for other a low-income people, so incomes there were low. Um, so you had a, an emergence of sort of a two-tier income distribution system in that sector and uh, uh, throughout the economy. Well then, Castro decided he didn't like that. He said, that was something we had to do, but I didn't really want to do it. Uh, so two years later, they started to clamp down and put controls on the sec on small enterprise again. And uh, I'm going to want to run out of time here. <coughs> there were many types of controls uh, uh, in implemented, and I'll summarize these uh, fairly quickly, perhaps. They restricted the types of activities that could be undertaken uh, by, by a small business. All professional activities were prohibited, for example. And then they defined the specific things that could be done. They had to get licenses from the government. Well, the government control, could control the sector really easily just by saying, no, you can't have a license. So they restricted access to licenses, uh, which held down the, uh, uh, the, the uh, numbers of small enterprises. Then they, they taxed them ridiculously hard. I mean, all small businesses in every country complain about taxation, and uh, rightly so in many cases. But in Cuba's case, the taxation was really uh, uh, crazy, really ridiculous. The, the real tax rate could exceed 100%, mainly because small enterprises 
could, uh, they were taxed on 90% of their gross income. If their cost of production buying inputs, say, was 50%, then they were being taxed uh, on, on uh, they were only allowed 10% for the, the, these costs of production. They were having a, a, an effective tax rate put on that, that small part of their value added in the enterprise. So in fact, the, the tax could exceed $100. They weren't permitted to deduct investment uh, from their, their uh, cost of production. And they had to pay their money up front, uh, not after they had earned the income. So it was, it was very difficult. Then there were other prohibitions, no credit, no advertising, no intermediaries. You couldn't have an enterprise making arts and crafts, for example, and work on that and have somebody else sell them. You had to, to uh, produce the stuff and sell it yourself. And then there was, there was a, a media campaign, basically, against small enterprise, uh, which was uh, not nice. Uh, that's just, I won't go over that. That's just a list of the illegalities, things which were illegal and for which people could be punished. Well, the consequences of, of uh, the tightening control on the sector were unpleasant and unfortunate because it, it, uh, they, it reduced all of the earlier positive results, limited job creation, uh, made things more difficult for everybody, made enterprises inefficient because they were so small, uh, and basically, it just wasted human resources, entrepreneurial skills and human resources. Um, another thing it did was to create contempt for the law. Uh, a culture of non-compliance developed. People wanted to evade restrictions as much as they could. They wanted to, to uh, avoid taxes as much as they could. So there was massive cheating. The government then established a whole corps of policemen to go around and ensure that all of the, uh, the uh, regulations were being followed, that taxes were being paid. But what happened? Many of those, how many, I have no idea, many of the inspectors became corrupted themselves. And there was an interesting case, a personal case that I knew well, because uh, our university gave uh, uh, a master's program in economics for young professors in Cuba to help jumpstart the introduction of Western economics in, in Cuba. Uh, we had one student who graduated who went to work as an inspector of restaurants. He had been flacco. He had been really, really thin uh, when we knew him as a student. Shortly after he had uh, his job in a restaurant, he was gordo. He was, he was big. Uh, so, uh, OK. Then, Raul came to power in 20, uh, 2006. After four years, he produced a new strategy. His strategy was to, interestingly enough, to downsize the state sector by 1.2 million people, and then later to 1.8 million people, reduce the state sector and hire them all in where? In the small enterprise sector. Uh, so all of a sudden, the small enterprise sector, which had been persecuted and, and criticized, it was to become the savior of the Cuban economy, providing produ productive jobs for all of the, the uh, uh, superfluous, surplus workers in the state sector. Well, that was really interesting. This is just a little estimate done by uh, uh, an economist of underemployment. This line here shows open unemployment as a percentage of total employment. But then, as an estimate of underemployment, uh, those who had jobs but were redundant, not really needed, uh, that estimate was very high. And this is the, the Raul Castro estimate here. Um, this was the official level of unemployment, very low. This was the, the uh, level of unemployment that, that uh, no, this was the level of employment that Castro, Raul Castro thought existed if you included uh, uh, the underemployed. So. They were going to fire all those people and absorb them in the small enterprise sector. Um, well, uh, the big question, would it be possible for the small enterprise sector to absorb that many uh, uh, bureaucrats who were being fired from the state sector? Well, that was really ambitious. In order to achieve that, oh, that was putting the cart before the horse, eh? 
because they talked about firing people first and then making the jobs after. Ooh, that doesn't make too much sense. It's, uh, the better thing to do is to create the jobs and encourage people to leave the state sector for the jobs in the emerging private sector. In order to, to uh, promote the, the uh, uh, small enterprise, they made further changes then. They expanded the activities that could be conducted. Um, they, they, uh, let's see. Yeah, they just, they added some new enterprises that could be, could be uh, 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 pursued. Uh, whoops. However, the, the key thing was that they, they uh, still prohibited professionals from pursuing professional activities. Um, they loosened up on some of the prohibitions a little bit, but not a whole lot. Um, they talked about doing all sorts of good things, but not too much happened. One interesting thing, uh, I mentioned the restaurants that had a limit of 12 chairs in the restaurant. They increased that limit to 20. Uh, so now um, a restaurant could be a little bit bigger. They increased the number of employees that could be hired, um, but still these restrictions continued. No intermediaries, no advertising, no access to foreign exchange, uh, no access to banks even. Oops, wrong thing. Whoa, what did I do here? Um, oh, and then taxation was liberalized a little bit, and I won't go into much detail there. Um, further changes then were introduced uh, about a year later, um, and these looked really small and petty. They were, um, but they permitted uh, private enterprise to sell to the state. That had been prohibited before. Uh, they per permit they per permitted the use of banking facilities. Um, they broadened the eligibility for self-employment a little bit. It had been restricted before. And you could rent facilities. Uh, if you wanted to s sell uh, artisanal products, art products, you could rent a space from somebody. You couldn't do that before. So the question, was it likely that these changes would produce 1.2 million jobs uh, in a short period of time, uh, about a two and a half year period? Well, there was these positive elements that were encouraging, um, but there were these negative elements, high taxation. There was a tax on hiring workers, surprisingly. Um, narrow definition of legal activities that could be undertaken. Exclusion of, oh yes, sir. Now what's the population of Cuba at this time, just to get um, that 1.2 million? It's, it's been stable and beginning to decline, eh? Right, but I mean, say 11 million. Of their total workforce, 1.2 million is a huge number, right? It is, it's massive. Uh, a population of 11 million, a labor force of probably 7 million. Um, so these are some of the negative things, and the bizarre restrictions uh, continued. Uh, restrictions on hiring workers continued. Uh, so the results was that job cr creation in the small enterprise sector was very slow. It was unable to absorb uh, all of the workers that were supposed to be laid off. But then very quickly it became apparently that this was shock therapy. It was too tough, it was too stiff. Uh, firing workers, firing 500,000 workers by March 31st, uh, 2011 was ridiculous, so they didn't do it. Um, however, their uh, program was not un unsuccessful. It was sort of successful. By liberalizing further, they increased uh, um, uh, self-employment very much. Uh, in fact, that's uh, as a percentage of total employment, that's a, a close to a tripling. And for the last year uh, that I saw numbers for, 2017, they had 580,000 people uh, working in the uh, self-employment sector. Um, more recently, there has been uh, minimal policy change uh, and, and some minor uh, slowdowns, I would say, reversals, but very, very minor. Um, 
so uh, the situation is such that, that uh, uh, the sector could be liberalized further. It's, it's, some major changes have been made, but more needs to be done. And here's a little summary of that. In terms of liber liberalizing lic licensing, um, they have done that. Anybody can now start a small business, uh, except doctors and a few other uh, professions. What they could also do is to permit all kinds of small business, uh, professional, non-professional, low-tech, high-tech, they could permit them all to be established. They don't. Uh, there, there are still tight restrictions on that. They could raise the limit on employees, which is still five employees uh, for most enterprises. That's very small. That condemns uh, most enterprises to inefficiencies. Uh, they could do that. They had a long way to go. They could provide legal sources for the purchase of inputs. And one, one problem has been uh, that there aren't official sources except dollar stores for the purchase of inputs. So that has led to a huge amount of theft from the state sector and uh, that small enterprises have to buy uh, uh, products from, from uh, uh, the illegal economy. Um, they could permit access to, to uh, uh, imported inputs or foreign exchange. They don't do that. Uh, they could eliminate silly restrictions. That has not been done. They could make the taxation system fairer and simpler. That has not been done. They could establish microcredit institutions. Uh, that has not been done. They could legalize intermediaries, especially in retailing. That has not been done. They could permit advertising. That has not been done. Uh, they could permit a ministry of small enterprise to emerge. Uh, that's a joke. That's not going to happen for a long time. Um, they have ceased the media campaign against small enterprise, however, uh, for the most part. So that is, that's one good thing. They need to build the credibility of public policy. Public policy has jumped around so much that it lost credibility. People didn't believe what the government was saying. So that needs to be built. There has been some stability since 2010 with some, some fluctuation. So that's good. That's improving. So the conclusion, I would say, is, is that uh, the small enterprise sector uh, has, has improved remarkably, uh, but new measures are desirable. Um, let me shift now to the cooperative sector. I want to say just a few words about uh, cooperatives. Legislation in 2012 legalized cooperatives in non-agricultural areas. Before that, there had been so-called cooperatives in agriculture, but that was a sham. They were fake cooperatives, you could say. They were, they were controlled ultimately by the state. Uh, true cooperatives um, need to be controlled by their employees or the entrepreneurs, if it's a, a co-op of entrepreneurs. Interestingly enough, Cuba has had a long history of co-ops. Back in the 1950s, uh, a lot of the buses, most of the buses, were organized in a cooperative enterprise. Very interesting. Then, uh, those of you who have been to Havana will recognize this building. This is the Central Diego. Um, that is the, uh, the old um, center for the, the uh, community of immigrants from Galicia in Spain. Uh, they established their own uh, mutual benef uh, benevolent society to provide insurance, social security, health coverage, and so on. In a sense, that was a cooperative for, uh, and a very big and prosperous cooperative for the immigrants from Galicia. The immigrants from Asturias did the same thing. Look at this palatial construction. This is now the art museum uh, in, in Havana. Um, but that was the Centro uh, Asturiano. Um, it, again, a benevolent society providing uh, services for the members of the uh, uh, people who immigrated from Asturias in Spain. Here's a new cooperative. 
Uh, and actually, this bus almost hit me, eh? I, I got out of the way just in time. Um, but there is a cooperative of buses like this, and there are now cooperatives of taxi drivers uh, in, in Havana. Here is a cooperative for the sale of agricultural products, a cooperative for, for uh, uh, automotive repair, a doctor's cooperative, which is very interesting, and I would like to know how that's working. And having said that, every country has, uh, almost every country, has a lot of cooperatives. Do you recognize these uh, logos? The United States has a, a very large cooperative sector, only about 5% of the total economy, but it's big. It's especially big in retailing, and I had no idea until I checked again the other day under Wikipedia, under, under cooperatives in the United States, there are so many retailing cooperatives. They are cooperatives of store owners, basically, uh, who have grouped together as, as a cooperative. So you can check Wikipedia uh, and, and see how significant the cooperative sector is in your country, uh, similarly in Canada. This, by the way, is the Green Bay Packers. I had no idea that the Green Bay Packers were a cooperative or uh, quasi-cooperative. Uh, well, um, cooperatives, in theory, uh, should have major advantages. Um, worker ownership and management should provide a powerful motivation to work hard. You're working for yourself. You're not working for the Waltons in Arkansas uh, or s some owner far away. You're working for yourself. That means you'd have motivation to work hard. You would also be looking at the people around you, providing pressure on them to work uh, diligently uh, also. So that should provide uh, a powerful incentive for such cooperatives to be efficient. Um, profit sharing, sharing uh, ensures that the workers' interests are aligned with the owners because the two are the same. This also uh, generates a more equal distribution of income um, than, than a, 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 what an owner-managed enterprise. Just think of what would happen if Walmart were a cooperative owned by all of the employees uh, in that vast uh, enterprise uh, rather than uh, a family-owned uh, mega corporation. In theory, such enterprises should have greater flexibility than state enterprises or even private enterprises because the employees, with, as the markets fluctuated and changed, the, uh, the employees, who are also the owners, uh, could absorb profit changes and maybe even income changes uh, if, if these became necessary. Uh, and other advantages. One advantage is that you have democracy in the workplace among owners or among entrepreneurs. Uh, that is valuable in itself. Oh, by the way, most university departments are in some sense cooperative, at least at Carleton. Right? And I presume it's the same in Kennesaw. Uh, so they're, uh, they're not owned, but they are managed by the members of the departments. Uh, well, uh, democracy in the workplace is, is valuable for itself. It may be a big advantage over state enterprises where people are just taking orders from above and, and sucking up to the, their superiors, or a privately owned enterprise where, again, they're doing what they're told by management in response to shareholders or owners. Um, well, democracy in the workplace is surprising. Could, could that exist in Cuba? There's a big question mark there. Cuba is very far from a democracy. It is a one-party, monopolistic uh, dictatorship. We don't call it a dictatorship, uh, but it's a totalitarian light. Uh, and the party manages the society, owns the media, all of the media, uh, it, uh, has its branches in the universities, in all enterprises, all government offices, all organizations. They all are, uh, face substantial control by the party. Well, is it possible that you could have true workers' democracy uh, in cooperatives in the Cuban context? So that is that would be nice. Uh, maybe uh, 
work, uh, workplace democracy could strengthen political democratization in Cuba, but that's dubious. Um, then Cuba's law also allowed for what they called second degree cooperatives. So these would be cooperatives of cooperatives. So to, to pick, put your mind around that, think of each Starbucks enterprise as being a cooperative owned and managed and, and operated by the people that work there. Uh, so that would be a sort of a producer's cooperative, but then you could have a cooperative of all of the, the Starbucks operations uh, in, in uh, Canada or the United States. So you, that would be a cooperative of cooperatives. Cuban law permits that, uh, their new cooperative law. So that is interesting. I'm not sure that it's happened yet, but it's a theoretical possibility. Uh, and you, uh, with that mechanism, you could get similar economies of scale that Starbucks, for example, already gets. Um, okay, Cuba has moved modestly into the direction of cooperatives. Not all that many have been formed, um, but it permits cooperatives in all areas. Uh, it has loosened, but not much, the, the approval process. Um, I think they would need to, to uh, permit direct access to foreign exchange for the purchase of imported inputs uh, if, if uh, such cooperatives were to be really effective. Um, and they would need uh, good credit facilities. They would, be, they would need to be able to borrow from banks uh, and uh, they would need to be able to purchase their, their inputs legally from the state sector, from f the foreign sector, or wherever. So uh, these are some of the policy requirements if, if uh, one is going to have uh, an effective uh, cooperative uh, system. There are difficulties with cooperatives. If cooperatives are so great, why haven't they taken over all of the economies of the Western world? They haven't. They're, they exist almost everywhere, but at a range of somewhere around 5%. And they've existed in Canada and the United States uh, since uh, for a long, long time. Uh, but they have not expanded. So the question is, if they're so great, if they're so efficient, why haven't they taken over in competition with, with private enterprises? Well, one problem there is that governance and management can be problematic, um, especially for a bigger co-op. Uh, governance is difficult. Um, the transactions costs, or just the difficulties of bringing people together, getting them to all agree on something, uh, th those difficulties can be severe. And we see those in some university departments, say. Eh? Um, personal animosities among people are, are problems. Ideological, political differences, and so on. Um, and for larger cooperatives, you need more complex governing structures, which are even more complex. So that's uh, problematic. In the Cuban case, uh, the, the Cuban government has been very slow in giving permission for cooperatives. It has given some permissions, but not very many. Um, and the big question is, what is the role of the Communist Party in all of this? Would the party keep out of cooperative management? And that's not clear at all. Um, and uh, I have not sort of uh, made a study of, of uh, how cooperatives are actually functioning, and I've not seen such a study. Uh, so that could, the, the party control of, of uh, uh, cooperatives could uh, stymie, could, could eliminate the possibility of worker democracy. In future, one would hope that uh, when Cuba becomes a multi-party democracy, which may, may not occur for decades, but if it were to become uh, a political democracy, uh, then the party would not be there and the cooperative movement would be, would be more genuinely cooperative. Well, to conclude on, on the cooperatives, um, one would think that there would be people in Cuba pushing for uh, sort of a cooperative strategy, a cooperative model for Cuba. 
that, I guess, is maybe a kind of socialism, cooperative socialism, although it doesn't get that name. Um, by the way, in Canada, we had for a long time a political party that took, took control of Western provinces and that is now a national party under a different name. The first name was the Cooperative Commonwealth Federation. And their idea was that, that uh, enterprises should be organized like cooperatives, one of their ideas. Uh, they have since uh, it morphed into a center-left party in Canada. They didn't do so well in the last election on, on Monday, uh, which you may have heard about. But uh, uh, if, if you could imagine Cuba converting its state enterprises into cooperatives and, and or a, a mix of uh, cooperatives, uh, domestic private-owned enterprises, foreign joint ventures, which I haven't talked about, but there are a lot of joint ventures in Cuba with Cuban state firms and foreign enterprises, the big hotels in the tourist sector, uh, a lot of the biggest enterprises in, in mining, for example, a Canadian company, uh, are joint ventures, so I haven't talked about them. But a cooperative model could be interesting for Cuba. Uh, it would not be a panacea. Uh, but uh, it's an interesting idea. Well, summary and conclusion. Past policies under Fidel Castro have wasted Cuba's most important resource. Uh, it's human resources, it's entrepreneurship. And that the destruction of that whole class of entrepreneurs back in the 1960s was a crazy thing to do. Liberalization has occurred on a sort of a step-by-step -step basis um, with uh, a major step in 1993, reversed partly, another major step in 2010, which has kept going with very minor modifications. Um, that is, is uh, uh, in, certainly in the right direction. The cooperative movement exists in small scale. <coughs> We don't know what its future might be, but then we don't know the future of, of small enterprise in Cuba or its political system either. Um, but uh, that could be interesting. And just to conclude, I would say that in terms of small business, uh, uh, major additional liberalization steps, letting markets function effectively would be very valuable. So thank you very much. That is my presentation. So now I welcome your questions, but I must confess I have a hearing problem. So I'll turn this thing up as much as I can. But please speak really loudly with your question, okay? And uh, uh, yes? Yeah, I have. <clears throat> well, first question is, I guess, very uh, acute one is because uh, there was, I think there was this uh, referendum, right, for the new constitution that, was, uh, um, that happened there recently. And from what I've heard, there was a lot of liberalization going on in this new constitution or the documents that, that were proposed there. So I don't know if you could elaborate more on that. Yeah, that just sort of certified or legalized what, what had, had happened. That didn't make further additional modifications. It, it just, just uh, uh, not certified. It articulated, I guess, the policies that had been uh, implemented, yeah. So is it, a, is it a similar situation to Peru in the, let's say, in the second uh, part of the 20th century, with uh, one described by Fernando de Sosa, with the, the type of you know, entrepreneurs going to the shadow and then institutions changing and it allowed basically the same type of inter entrepreneurial activity, but now in a legal aspect? Would you compare it? Yeah, yeah, no, that's very interesting. Hernando de Soto was a Peruvian uh, sociologist, I guess, who argued that, that uh, the, uh, in Peru and Latin America, they had a huge informal economy, legal, it wasn't illegal as in Cuba, uh, but if it could be formalized, if the, the uh, entrepreneurs could be given property rights, recognition by the state, then that in a sense would, would uh, help make them much more productive because they could get credit if they were actually shown to own their enterprise, the land that it was on. Uh, they could get credit, they could formalize, and become more, more uh, efficient. Yeah, so that's, it's a, a similar thing. By bringing enterprises up from underground, 
in the Cuban case, Ill, Ill, the illegal underground, uh, to bringing them into the light. Uh, uh, the government could make them more efficient. The government could tax them. That was a big motivation, and those enterprises pay lots of tax. Any other questions? Yes? Now, what share of the uh, GDP uh, is contributed by the private sector in Cuba? Oh, gosh. Uh, I wish I had that number for you. I should have it. Uh, I would think it would be like uh, uh, 6 or 7 or 8 percent, and that's the small enterprise sector. The foreign, uh, the joint venture sector also uh, it produces a, a, a good chunk, a big chunk of GDP, especially in tourism and mining, nickel mining. Cuba is a big miner of nickel. Um, so uh, I'm sorry, I can't give you a precise number for that. Eh? In terms of employment, however, it's now about 8%. Yes? Of course, it goes back in time. Why was it that the Soviet Union was um, subsidizing Cuba? the sugar and all that, to such a huge extent. And why was Fidel okay with that? Was it the Cold War? Uh, it was the Cold War. Okay. Cuba was an outpost, you know, 90 miles off Miami, uh, sort of aimed at the heart of the United States. So they wanted to keep uh, Cuba as a good friend. Fidel said that nobody subsidizes us. We pay our way. Okay, that's what he said. That's what, his, that's what uh, people around him said. That was not true, of course. Because uh, all those trade credits never to be repaid, uh, all of the, the, the hidden price subsidization that I mentioned, that you mentioned, uh, that was maybe the most significant. Because when oil prices rocketed up in the 1970s due to OPEC, Cuba continued to get uh, low-cost oil from the Soviet Union, big subsidy that uh, the rest of the world did not enjoy, not experience. Uh, then. Uh, they continued to pay a, a super high price for their sugar imports from Cuba, a large multiple of the, the world price, uh, and that also provided Cuba with foreign exchange that it could use it, uh, to buy imports. Uh, and then there was direct assistance. So uh, why did Russia do that? I think strategic reasons, uh, mainly. Um, and I think, it, if you remember that graph, it got very, very onerous. And when the Soviet Union ran into trouble uh, by 1987, 89, then they started to rethink that and, and reversed it very quickly. I yes? just want to add one more thing, just because I am Russian. So, uh, <laughs> indeed, uh, when you are, there is, a, so when you are a totalitarian regime, which was a Soviet Union, too, right, uh, you want to have some friends in the world. And that's why uh, helping those friends, helping those countries is one of those good ways to make friends. I mean, in reality, they're not real friends at the end. And, and actually, this is something that uh, what is Putin doing right now. If you, if you, if you notice that he has given a lot of money, credits to Venezuela, for example, uh, they have they have just um, um, they've just forgiven a I think it was 17 billion dollars that of Venezuela to Russia. So they, he's given some money to Turkey, to Belarus. So. Uh, this is, I think this is just historical that dictators, they want to kind of stick together because they are a minority, right? So that's a natural quality of human nature that, you know, that you would do that. So even, even which is surprisingly uh, harming your own people, you would do that. So. Uh, an interesting thing, after Russia, Venezuela became the sugar daddy of Cuba. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. and uh, again, that was through the price of oil uh, which, which was provided by Venezuela to Cuba, and credits. Cuba was able to buy uh, petroleum uh, at uh, a very low cost on credits, and I forgot, sorry, I've forgotten the, the, uh, the detail of the terms, but the terms were very, very lenient and amounted to major subsidization. Well, that's gone now. Venezuela is in deep trouble, much worse than Cuba, uh, so uh, Venezuela is no longer a sugar daddy. Now, China. <laughs> Uh, uh, the Chinese-Cuba relations uh, are warming up. China has a major presence in, in Cuba, uh, as in all of Latin America, all of Africa, all of Asia. Uh, I mean, it, it's incredible. The new cars coming into Cuba are Chinese, for the most part, except for the diplomatic vehicles. The new cars coming into a lot of Latin America 
are, are Chinese. You haven't got them here in the States. We don't have them in Canada yet. But hey, just wait. Just wait till Walmart uh, starts selling <laughs> Chinese cars. Uh, that, that, will be, that will really cause a problem. Um, so China is As, uh, a major trading partner with Cuba. Uh, they are providing major credits. Um, other countries in Latin America, such as Brazil, uh, have been providing big credits to Cuba. Brazil provided about uh, close to a billion dollar credit for the construction of a new container port outside Havana. And this is an interesting detail. Havana is a fantastic city. Uh, it's a, an amazing historical city. Um, the, the harbor of Havana is, is, is uh, it, it, uh, incredible. But the Spanish Armada used to collect in the Havana Harbor before it returned to Spain with, with treasure. So uh, Havana uh, had, was building its first cathedral in 1534. The first Canadian, or the, pardon me, the first Frenchman to spend a winter in Canada, 1608. OK, can you imagine that? That's uh, 70 years before Canada even was uh, met Europeans, or Europeans met Canada. Um, they were building a cathedral in, in Havana. So it has an ancient history. Um, well, a lot of industry located are, are in Havana. In fact, Havana was an incredible manufacturing center. They built some of the ships that were used by Napoleon in the Battle of Trafalgar, if you remember that at all. Uh, they built the biggest four-layer four cannon uh, 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 ships uh, sunk by, the, by Lord Nelson uh, in, in uh, what was that, uh, 1812, I guess, also. Um, so there was a lot of industry there. The Havana Harbor then became a total mess uh, because there were industries which were very dirty all around it. Now the, Cu the Cubans are cleaning up Havana Harbor. They are wanting to make the whole area around the harbor into a tourist mecca. That's going to be hard because of industrial waste. And because of that, they've moved the whole container port and the shipping of products 30, 30 kilometers out of Havana uh, towards the east in a place called Mariel. So how did I get onto that? But that's, uh, that's a, a, an interesting evolution of Havana. All of you should try and get to see Havana, Old Mexico City, Williamsburg, and Quebec uh, in, in the Western Hemisphere before you die. Uh, yes? 1965, as, as a student did. Eh? Okay, and I saw you had some pictures in 2011 as well. Um, I was wondering, actually, like, has the morale of people changed in those times? Like, when you go into, like, the cities and the streets? That's hard to say. A, a really curious and interesting thing is that even um, when relations have been really tough between the United States and Cuba, I mean, worse than now, um, You'd see Cubans in the street wearing American T-shirts and and American flags, and that was quite okay. Uh, with uh, yeah, it, I I couldn't believe that. Um, so uh, it's a love-hate relationship, eh? Because the, the links between the two countries are so deep. Oh, by the way, I saw the Rolling Stones uh, concert in Havana on television, not live. <laughs> um, but um, that was amazing to me. They were in the largest uh, public space. Uh, Mick, Mick Jagger, who's uh, almost as old as I am, was prancing around the stage. But there were like tens, if not hundreds of thousands scattered around. They were singing with him and, and uh, jumping up and down and doing, doing what they do at rock concerts. Um, I couldn't believe it. He was so popular. And uh, people knew the, the music of the Rolling Stones so well. That was a total surprise because I, I spent, I've spent about two years in Cuba, mainly in the 90s, about two months every year almost in the 1990s. And uh, then what was fascinating was Cuban music. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's fantastic Cuban music. Some of you uh, may have heard of the Buena Vista Social Club, uh, the music of that group, uh, just phenomenal stuff. And there's an interesting story there because Fidel, when he came in, uh, he wanted to abolish even, even private musicians. 
So all of the old nightclubs, the bars that used to have Cuban music shut down. The music that he wanted was, was political music. So they, they, spo they sponsored and pushed political music. The old musicians from the, the, uh, before the revolution went to work as shoe shiners uh, and, and that kind of thing. Well, a Dutchman by the name of Rye Cooter went to Cuba in 1993 and tried to revive the Cuban music. And he, he put together a band of, of the people who had worked at this nightclub called the Buena Vista Social Club. He put them together and produced a fantastic album of traditional Cuban music, which took over the world. I don't know if, uh, listen to it if you get a chance. Google it, Buena Vista Social Club. Uh, other questions? I have one more question, if you don't mind. Uh, what, could, you, could you elaborate a little bit on the demographic situation in Cuba? Because from, I've been to Cuba and have talked to the locals, and they say there is a problem that, that educated people are leaving the country. Is this true? Oh, yeah. Uh, well, uh, yes, indeed. Cuba, like a lot of Western high-income Western countries, is facing what you could call a demographic crisis. Um, back in the 1990s, you could say that the women went on strike uh, and started to have fewer children. So the, the fertility rate went down to about 1.6 uh, children per woman. That is, you need 2.2 children per woman to have population stability in the very long uh, run. So uh, the Cubans were not reproducing themselves. Uh, and that's the case with most of Europe now. That's the case with Canada. Um, that's the case with, with uh, uh, South Korea, Japan. Many countries have, uh, are, are starting to face major population decline, especially Japan and Korea right now. Um, so that has been a, a problem for Cuba, and they have also faced steady emigration. Um, Cubans who, who can get out do get out. Um, of, the, of the 40, pardon me, of the 76 graduates, of the master's program, which we provided at the University of Havana for young professors, uh, 40 have left the country. And the reason we gave the program in Cuba was to, to uh, prevent people from leaving. Because if we had given the program in Canada, they all would have ended up in Miami. I kid you not. Well, uh, of the 40 who, have, who uh, uh, have emigrated, they are scattered all over the place. Some are in Ottawa, Toronto, Quebec, a lot in Miami. Santiago, Chile, London, England, uh, Madrid, and so on. They're all over the place. So you have Cuban, part of the, parts of the Cuban diaspora everywhere. So Cuba has, is facing now a, 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 a gradually shrinking population. Okay, thank you. Oh, thank you.